All right, friends, it is the top of the hour, which means it's time to go. How are you today? Um, let me know real quick. Can you see uh, my screen, my slides here, my White Shark series graphic? Can you hear me? And uh, once I see that confirmation, we'll really get going. Uh, today, we're going to have a fun time. We're going to have so much fun today talking all about the Light Shark, talking all about networking. Um, so what we're going to do today is dive pretty deep into networking on the Light Shark. And we're kind of taking a, a two-tiered approach today. So the first portion of the webinar is going to be all about talking about different scenarios, different popular uh, ways of setting up networks, and how that's going to apply to the Light Shark. Um, I'm going to give this to you today as a primer on networking pretty much from the bottom. So it's it's going to start with the very basic stuff and how it applies to the Light Shark, um, whether that be an LS1, whether that be an LS core, wing, nodes, any combination of those. We'll be talking about all that stuff today. So as we're going throughout today's webinar, there is a chat section. Uh, a few of you guys have found that. Thank you for letting me know that you could see and hear me. That is greatly appreciated. And there is also a Q&A. And my one ask, as always, is if you do have a question, pop it into that Q&A section just because it allows me to uh, make sure I don't get it lost in the chat. And sometimes I'm going to leave it there for a little while um, if I have a session coming up where it makes more sense to address that particular question. Awesome. So let's go ahead, guys. Remove any distractions you have so that you guys can focus on today's webinar. And let's dive in. So the, the very first question that we get with the light shark and a lot of people ask is all about, should you put your light shark on a larger network? Should you even do that, right? Because if we start at the base level, the light shark, whether it be the LS1 or the LS core console, it has built in Wi-Fi. It has a basic uh, router and access point that allow you to connect to it wirelessly, get your control and, you know, you're good to go. And so the first question we got to ask is, should you, or, you know, why should you even put your light shark on a larger network? Because to be honest, for a lot of, a lot of people's situations, it, you might not need to. So I would say you, you probably don't need to put it on a larger network. If you only need to remote uh, control the light shark with a few dedicated devices, and, you know, while you're controlling the light shark, while you're using those devices, you're going to pretty much just use them for the light shark. Um, you're not going to need to control other devices like an audio console or something else. And you don't need internet on that device when you're controlling the light shark, because, you know, if you've got the light shark screen up the whole time, there's no need for internet. Um, also, if you find the built-in wireless to be sufficient, because as it goes with, you know, different uh, wireless lighting consoles and audio mixers and devices like that, the wireless that's built into it is okay, right? It does a good job in smaller venues, but if you've got a congested wireless space, you'll probably find that, and you're in a bigger space, you, you may find that the built-in wireless isn't sufficient, and you want to boost that by putting the Light Shark on a larger network, okay? So you should put your light shark on a larger network. If you need internet on that same wireless connection as control of the light shark, maybe it's the kind of situation where uh, you may not change things on the lighting that much. And so you'll navigate away from that page on your tablet or your, your computer or whatnot, and you'll be using uh, the internet on other windows. Uh, if you need to control other devices, as we talked about, such as an audio console, that's probably the the most popular other device we, we see and we hear about. Uh, if you want to send your control that's, you know, controlling the light shark interface and or your networked DMX data through an existing network. So let's unpack that for a second. Um, if you're in a facility, maybe it's a church or a music venue, um, a school, and you've got the area where you control things and you've got the stage, and between those two areas, rather than running a line of either DMX or network to control your lights, um, maybe you already have network infrastructure in the building uh, and it's configured well and you could just in theory connect in both places and then not have to run a cable from your control area to your stage. 
you would use that existing network. There's some caveats with this and we'll talk about it. Um, and then lastly, you should uh, consider and you, you probably want to put your light shark on a larger network if you want to possibly connect from a outside network, meaning that maybe you're managing a venue and you want to do that from afar. You could use a program like log me in or something like that to be able to log into a computer that's in a different venue, you know, adjust something in their lighting system and then close out of there. Um, ultimately, you know, that's more, uh, you know, that's not something that's super popular, but from time to time, I do hear folks who are needing to do that. So what do we need to consider, first of all, um, if we're going to connect to a larger network? Because some of this stuff is really, really important. Um, if you don't pay attention to this, you may have some serious problems and then uh, we, we don't want you to be frustrated. So um, uh, thoughts to consider when on a larger network. The first thing is who has access to this network and is it public? Because after all, with a LightShark console, I can just whip open a browser and go to lightshark.work or go to the IP address of the LightShark and I can then control the console if I'm on the venue's Wi-Fi. And if it's public Wi-Fi, in theory, anyone could walk in and do that. Now, you know, I'm not gonna lie, right? It's pretty unlikely that there's a nefarious person walking into your venue who goes, oh, they have a light shark. I know how to connect with that. They log onto the Wi-Fi, they connect to it, and they start messing around with it. It could happen. Um, you know, almost more likely is maybe a disgruntled employee, former technician, whoever walks in and says, I'm going to mess with these people, or they sit out in their car in the parking lot, and they jump on the public network, and, you know, they're, they're just like, hey, I'll control the lights from here. You know, th that's a consideration. Um, you know, is it a super valid point? You know, some people would argue, no, nobody's ever going to touch my console. But, you know, everybody says that until something happens, right? Uh, I and mean, we don't want you to have a bad experience. Uh, we also got to consider what other protocols, what other type of data or information are on this network? And are they friendly with having, being on the network with other protocols? So, and, and as an example, ArtNet is not. So just as an example, maybe you're using a audio network uh, and you're using uh, Dante, which is um, friendly with other protocols, but maybe you're also using AVB or some other type of signal, or maybe you've got ArtNet from another lighting console or you're using the LightShark to send ArtNet, though we do recommend SACN. Um, you've got to keep in mind when you're connecting on a network, what else is on that, okay? Because we cannot, especially with ArtNet, we can't run other types of signal on the same network. ArtNet is not designed to work with other protocols on the same network, and more often than not, you will have some kind of problem, whether that be the ArtNet uh, has, causing flickers where they flash, there's a what, flash to white every so often, or the other one I see is you just can't get to the light shark control interface um, because there's some other type of network traffic that's using up the whole network effectively and kind of blocking everything else out, okay? And then the third thing that you want to think about when connecting to a larger network is, okay, what is the IP address range of that larger network, okay? Because this is one thing that I see a lot, and we'll go over this too later, is when you're connecting to a device like a light shark. So the light sharks for, you know, instance, start with an IP address of 2.0.0.1 from the factory, right? That's what they, they come set as. If you go and plug that into a network that's in the say 10 dot range or the 192.168.0 range, um, you're not going to be able to reach that device from most places on that network, okay? So you need to change the light shark to be in the range of your larger network. Let's talk about that. So an IP address, to give a good definition of some different network terms right here, uh, I pulled this off the internet, is a unique string of characters that identifies each computer. And I, I actually put a little asterisk in my head after computer. Um, using the internet protocol to communicate over a network. What does this mean? Well, this means that uh, the IP address is something that's given 
to any device that's on the network. In fact, not only any device, actually on a technical basis, it's any network interface, okay? So like I'm on a pretty typical desktop computer here and my desktop computer has two network interfaces. Well, three or four, but, but a general desktop computer has two, right? And it has a wireless and it has a wire. They each have their own IP address, okay? Which is a way that that computer's identified on a network. But there's something else too when, when we're filling out IP addresses. You may have seen this and it's the subnet mask. A subnet mask is not something cool that you wear over your face at a, a party in Halloween, but rather it is a 32-bit number, as I found also online, uh, created by setting host bits to all zeros and network bits to all ones. And this way the subnet mask separates the IP addresses into the network and host addresses, okay? Now, that might just sound like some technical goobity gob to you, and truth be told, I'm not an IT professional, um, though I do enjoy learning and stretching myself in new ways. And so if we boil it down, the simplicity, the simple uh, idea of a subnet mask and why it's called a mask is that it allows networks to filter different traffic. And so in a typical network, we're going to have a router and that router may have or will have an IP address and a subnet mask, okay? And we'll go over uh, a couple examples here in a few minutes of how those work and how uh, the subnet mask requires us to keep um, any two devices that wanna talk to each other within the same IP address range. So an octet is something else we're gonna talk about when it comes to networking. And what it refers to is just these numbers here, okay? 192.168.0.1. Each of these three digits, because this one on a technical level is 192.168.000.001. Um, each of those three digits is called an octet, okay? And these are IP address uh, examples. And these at the bottom, the 255s, are subnet mask examples. So... When we see a subnet mask, the simple explanation of, of simple subnet masking is that if there's a 255, that means the number needs to match between two computers for them to be able to talk, okay? Or two network devices, you know, all of these things are computers, right? The light sharks and the wings and the nodes, they're, they're all computers, okay? Um, so the 255s have to match, okay? The zeros do not have to match. However, overall, the, the complete number between any two devices needs to be different, okay? So they need to be within the same range. So if you have a, a typical subnet mask of 255.255.255.0, that means the first three sets of numbers need to match. The last number can be different. And in fact, it needs to be, okay? Um, because no two devices on the same network can have the same IP address. It doesn't work. Um, it, it's, it's against the way that, it, that things are supposed to be. And, and so you'll only be able to reach one of them. Um, if we have this one, 255.0.0.0, that means that our first number needs to match. Maybe we do a two dot, but then the next three numbers, uh, these 0.0.0 for the IP address can be different, okay? And those two devices would still be able to talk to each other, even if all three numbers were different. Uh, if they each had the subnet mask of 255.0.0.0, they'd be able to then talk to each other, okay? Now, another uh, term here as we get into, I promise there will be some pretty pictures and diagrams and uh, how-tos here in a minute, is a gateway, okay? You may see the term gateway if you're configuring a computer, if you're configuring um, a light shark LS1 or core, and all that a gateway means is this is a firewall, a router, or a server that allows traffic to go through it, okay? So this is, this is actually the least essential number when we're configuring these things. Um, as I mentioned, on the LS1s and cores, there is a gateway field, and typically that is your router that is connecting you to an outside network or that is routing the traffic for your small network. And you only really need this to fill out to be able to use the lightshark.work um, name where you type that into the web browser and it'll bring your interface up no matter what the IP address is. 
you can always type into your web browser the IP address. And as long as you're within the same range, um, even if you don't have a gateway, you will be able to reach that Light Shark device. Okay. So now that we've talked about all of these different terms and a, a general idea of what they mean and how they apply to us, the question then becomes, how do you build a show network, okay? Because most simply, and for a lot of situations, um, just building a small show network is going to be all you're going to need with a light shark, right? You just need a network that you can put your light shark on, uh, maybe a couple other devices, and be able to control them during a show or service, right? You don't need uh, to be connected to the internet. You don't need to be connected to a wider facility network in the sense of, you know, maybe you've got, like I, I visited a uh, school and um, church, a church with a, a school attached to it the other week. And, you know, their tech director was like, hey, you know, anytime somebody calls me, I have the ability and I need the ability if I'm in the classroom uh, you know, way across the building or in the parking lot to turn on the lights in the, in the sanctuary. Okay. Well, uh, for some situations, yeah, you're going to want to connect to that larger network. But for a lot of people, we can start with a basic show network. So what does a basic show network look like? Well, it could look like any number of things, such as this. It could be a LS1 or a core connected to a node. Now, in this instance, you're, you're going to notice that these devices are just connected. The, the double arrow is representative of a network cable. And the reason why I chose a double arrow is because when we're working with networking, data and communication is flowing both ways between all these items, okay? So that's why we got a double arrow here, all right? And so then um, you, you say, okay, so can you really just connect this with a network cable between, you know, the... LS1 and LS core and the LS node, and, and can it be just a regular network cable? And the answer is yes. Um, if you've ever read any networking textbooks or anything like that, they're going to talk to you about, oh, if you're connecting two devices and you don't have a switch or a router, more on that in a second, then you need to use what's called a crossover cable, okay? That's simply not true anymore. Um, with pretty much any modern device, they're not going to require that. They're going to figure it out on their own. Okay, that was something that, gosh, I don't think I've used a crossover cable in 10 years. Um, and uh, even back then, it was pretty rare. So crossover cable is not necessary, but I did just throw out a word of a switch and a router. So let's talk about switches and routers and how they work within our system. So a network switch in its simplicity is a simple device that connects multiple network devices together in both directions, sending and receiving. So if you've looked at one of these LS nodes, the uh, one, two, or the four, you notice there are two network ports on them. This is a network switch. Unlike DMX, which can travel from light to light in a daisy chain and, and travels through those lights, whether the light is powered on or not, a network switch and network signal is different, okay? A network switch takes the data coming in. So for just an example, actually, we'll get to that in an example in a minute. We can connect a, a core and a one together to the same node if we desired, and they both connect to one of these ports here, and the switch, the simple two-port switch here in this node will do all of the connecting between them, okay? Then we talk about a router. So a router is real simple, okay? A router is just a device that connects networks together. So routers and their job is just to connect smaller and bigger networks together. Um, basically, the gist is when there are, you know, when you're connecting to the internet or a larger network, uh, the, the larger network or the second network may have a different IP address range or may have... Um, devices using the same IP addresses as you have on the smaller network. And so the only way to connect the two to basically change those IP addresses or whatnot is to use a router to connect those devices together. Okay. And that's a, a slightly simplified version of it, but it works uh, for what we're doing here. And so you, you might say to yourself, well, David, I have a router. How come your definition doesn't say anything about connecting wirelessly? Well, 
a router actually doesn't have anything to do with wireless connection. That's actually an access point. I know you've been lied to, don't worry. We'll talk about that in a second. But an access point gives you the ability to connect wirelessly to a network. And so what this looks like is when you're talking about a larger network, a more than a basic network in any decent sized facility, this is what you're gonna run into. You're gonna have three devices, okay? You're going to have switches that various pieces of equipment and computers connect to. You're going to have a router, which connects that network to the larger network of the internet. It will do things like hand out the IP addresses to the different computers uh, using something called DHCP, which we will talk about in a few. And then also, it, there, there are access points, often multiple in a larger uh, facility, where you can connect to the network wirelessly. Um, but ultimately, the access point isn't really doing a lot of thinking. It's, it's, it's connected all together within uh, with the router and the switches, okay? So if you got one of these, like we talked about, right? You, you go on Amazon or you go to an electronics store and you say, I need a router. And they say, here you go, you know, here's a 30 to $100 device that um, is a router, right? Well, that's only partially true. So when we have a, a consumer grade, you know, kind of a home-based type router, okay, or a small office router, um, it, it combines all three of those, okay? So it's the router, it's the access point, and it also generally has a small switch in it with, you know, four ports or something like that, okay? That's also why uh, you'll notice on these, I don't have a picture of the back of one of these, but there's usually a blue port and that's the one you connect to the internet with. And then there's usually yellow or white ports that are the switched ports for your different devices. And they're separate because ultimately they have separate purposes and it makes the setup a lot simpler if they just uh, make one port always the, the network, the internet port, okay? So talking about routers, we can build up a small show network like this. Maybe we've got an LS1 and an LS core. Maybe we just have the LS core running simply as a backup. And we could have those guys on the same network connect them both to a router, okay? That would work. As long as, as we, we verified earlier, that our IP address range is within the same range. So if we're using 192.168.0, then all three of these devices would start that way and have a different last number from uh, one to about 240, okay? Um, or you choose a different IP address range and you make sure everything's within that range with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0 or uh, 255.000, but the first one I like better uh, because it does um, just keep the traffic level down. Though in this small network, it truly does not matter, okay? So that's one example of a way you can set this up. And, and this would allow you to have, you know, both consoles or just a core or just an LS1. We could connect it up here uh, to the router, make sure they're on the same um, IP address range as noted before. And then you would have a greater level of wireless control, um, better than the built-in antenna. Uh, of course, how much better depends on the router you buy and you'd be able to control it over a longer range. And for a lot of users, that's exactly what you need. You just connect a wire out of the network port on the back of the core or the one into the router, not the internet port, but any of the regular ports, and then set it up. Um, and typically default settings are, are fine as long as you keep that same IP address range. And again, the router is usually dot one um, and other devices can be above that. You're ready to go, okay? It could also look like this, as we noted, where we just have a switch in the mix and that switch is built into the LS Node 4, okay? It could also look like this, where we go ahead and we've got a wing in the middle. And the wing, if we look at the back, if we remember, if, you, if you've seen a wing, has a three port network switch built in. Why three ports? My best bet is that's all that fits. Um, but three ports is enough to do some, some simple things. And so now we can just connect the LS1 to the wing. We can connect the core to the wing. We connect the, um, the node to the wing. That's what the thing is called. And we would go ahead and set them all up and be good to go. Okay.
Here's another option. Maybe we go ahead and oops, here's another. We add an audio console. Now we notice here that uh, we've got four devices and we've only got a three port no switch there. So we would need to technically add another switch here or maybe it was just an LS1, a wing, an audio console and a node. Or maybe it was just an LS1, a chorus backup, a wing and an audio console, etc. Okay, the key here is if we're wired and we're all on the same small network and we don't have a router built in, we need to set all our IP addresses manually, okay? Because those IP addresses, uh, manually or static as it's called, are um, going to, are generally determined by a router. But in show networks, we have two options. We'll talk about in a minute why uh, we like to set things statically, but if we don't have a router, we don't have a choice. We need to set each one static. So you could go, you know, 2.0.0.1, .2, .3, .4, .5. You're done. Okay, nice and simple. And so we could actually add a router to the mix here. Okay, a router can really help us. So um, in, in the case of a router, now we have the ability to get wireless control as well because there's an access point built into that. So now, probably at front of house, we've got our router in there and we've got our wing and we've got our core and we've got our one. And then on stage, we've got our node, right? And maybe our audio console's back here, maybe it's on stage, slash, et cetera, whatever device you have, okay? In this case, we have two options as to how to set our IP addresses. We could let the router take care of it, okay? Um, or we could set them manually or statically. So which should we do? Um, well, there's gonna be some benefits to setting them static, okay? Uh, the biggest benefit is when we're using OSC. So if you're using OSC triggered via the Touch OSC app or via any other type of OSC device on your network, uh, like the LS Wing or like any other OSC device, um, there are many out there. And um, you with OSC generally set the IP address of the destination where that OSC data is going, okay? If we don't set our IP addresses statically, if we just let our router set them dynamically, then every time we boot up our gear, um, that IP address is going to change. Now, I do have to put an asterisk there if anybody's a networking pro in the room, because you can, in many systems, in many routers, reserve an IP address, meaning you go in that router and you look at a device and you say, okay, this tablet's IP address is right now, you know, 192.168.0.120, um, okay? That's what this tablet has as, as its IP address now. And you can reserve that. You can tell the router, hey, when you see that device hop on, you give it this IP address every time. And it will say, okay, I'll do that. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, it'll be nice, okay? Um, there are also benefits when using multiple light sharks on the same network. Again, that's more rare. Um, but sometimes with larger facilities, people have multiple rooms with multiple light sharks in them. And if you just type into your web browser, lightshark.work, you're not going to get, uh, you're not going to have a way to access both devices. You'll only be able to access one at a time. But if we uh, type in the IP address of each console, then we can access them individually. We can bookmark it on our home screen or on our web browser. And if we had let these be dynamic again, just like with OSC, then every time we boot up our system, these things would change and we'd have to go figure out what our IP addresses are, which is not really a fun activity that I like to do on my afternoon of my day off. So now that we've talked about the basics of setups with a smaller, a show network, a, a typical closed network, how do you connect to a larger network? That's a question that I get a lot. And the answer, which might surprise you, is you go find somebody else to do it. Don't do it yourself. Now, I'm somewhat kidding. What? Well, sometimes. Okay. If you're working with a network that's large enough that there's an IT staff on site or even just contracted part-time, then it is best to use what you've learned in this webinar and use you know, the basics of learning, okay, here's what I need to set up and, and how it works, then that's the point where you should pick up the phone and talk to the IPT professional who's in charge of that larger network, okay? Um, because ultimately, 
um, if it's a network that's of a significant size enough that there's someone who manages it, they're going to want to have a part in helping you get set up. And also, they're probably going to do a better job and it's going to be less frustrating than if you try to get into things and do it, okay? <laughs> and so when we're connecting to a larger network, you'll, you'll notice that this image in this example looks a lot like when we just had a small home router right in this spot here, but now we've put a larger network. Because ultimately the concepts are the same. We could have our stuff all connected um, together using a basic network switch, whether that be you know, a simple unmanaged switch that we bought online or the switches built into the wing and the uh, nodes. And then we connect from one of those switches to that larger network and then we're good to go. Okay, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it, as noted before, oops, I got an extra arrow, is that you would put these individual devices, plug them into their closest network port, you know, on the wall, um, in a network closet, on a switch somewhere. You plug them all in wherever they are in the facility to that larger network, okay? And then that larger network would basically be in the center. So you would use, like I mentioned before, that existing network wiring uh, to connect your different devices together. And so it's basically the same process, okay? Except you will need to verify that your IP address is in range of that larger network, right? If that larger network is at 10.0.0. whatever, um, you need to make sure your IP addresses are in that range. You also need to make sure if you're setting static IP addresses that those IP addresses aren't already in use by some other device. Again, that's why if someone is managing that larger network already, you go talk to them. Um, it's also recommended that you use a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. Uh, sometimes various pieces of lighting gear will go 255.000, um, but that opens you to more of the network that you have access to. Uh, more devices that it's listening to and more things that it could be communicating with. And that's generally not a good idea. You only want to communicate with the item that uh, you need to communicate with. Okay. Uh, then you want to make sure all other protocols play well together. As we talked about, Artnet does not, is the big uh, elephant in the room that doesn't play well with other protocols. SACN, which the light shark prefers anyways, uh, does a much better job. And then if you are on a public network, like it's a facility-wide network that also has public Wi-Fi on it, et cetera, then you really want to consider using a VLAN. And you might say, okay, David, what's a VLAN? Why do I care, right? Um, so a VLAN just stands for a virtual local area network. Okay, very simple. Um, and basically what it is, is you plug your stuff in like this. You plug it into whatever the closest port is on your larger network, right? And then you have your networking guru or you, you learn to do it yourself because um, it can't be done. It's not crazy difficult. And you set up a VLAN that says, okay, I've got this guy, you know, plugged into port one over here. And then on this other switch, this guy's plugged into port 20. This audio console is plugged in on a different port somewhere else. And this guy's on the fourth port. And then you actually go into the switch and it has to be a, a switch that can do uh, layer three traffic such as VLANs. And you go into that switch and you say, okay, these ports are on this particular VLAN, which is my AV VLAN, you know, typically my audio visual or maybe just my lighting VLAN, right? And then you separate that network traffic. And it's like, it's, it gives you the benefits of being able to plug your stuff in anywhere in the building, use that existing network infrastructure, that existing cabling that's there. But it separates you traffic-wise so that your network traffic of light shark control data and SACN data and maybe OSC isn't out there interacting with other devices. So if on the public network, for example, somebody opens up OSC and starts sending out a bunch of random commands over it, it doesn't bog down your OSC because they're effectively on different networks on a virtual basis. Um, so as long as the network as a whole isn't overwhelmed with data, um, your stuff will be in its own lane. It'll be doing its own thing and it'll just be fine and happy and dandy. And then typically with a VLAN, it's going to have its, its own um, wireless network 
that could be on the same access point because an access point uh, in a large network can have multiple wireless uh, names and multiple connection points wirelessly. Uh, and some of those can be locked, right? So that you can connect to that guy. It's on a totally separate VLAN uh, for production stuff. Uh, that VLAN may or may not have internet. You, you and your network professional can choose that. And then you're off to the races. You're good to go. It's like you're on your completely separate network. But the big key is that um, you are so good. You know, you are just good with, uh, you know, doing your own thing and being in your own space. Okay. So that was the first portion of the webinar. I know that's a lot of info here. And I want to go through some basic software setup and, and, and uh, give, answer some questions as well. So let me pop over here. I've got Chrome open over here. And I've gone ahead here. I've got a light shark connected on my network here. I've got a wing connected. I also have a uh, LS Note 4. And then last, I have a second Light Shark console. Okay. This time, a uh, LS Core. So the first one's an LS1, the second one's an LS Core. Not that it matters for the sake of this example. Okay. All four of these are working together and, you know, are here on my network. Okay. Um, as we can see, this first Light Shark is 192.168.0202. And then I've got dot 151 is the wing, 205 is the node and 220 as the other light shark. Now you do have to space some of these guys out a little um, just to be aware. Um, most of the light shark consoles and wings use two IP addresses and they'll typically use them in order. Uh, but let's go through the basic setup of all of these. So just as an example, actually this, this example came up the other day uh, from uh, Carlos and Christian there at uh, Gamma who are US distributor at Etnia. And they wanted to go ahead and they had an LS node. So I'll just go here to my LS node for it. I believe theirs was a two that they were going to have. And they wanted to set up the two DMX ports and set it up to an LS core so that at the end of the day, their client could just plug the two guys in, plug in the core, plug in, plug it into a network cable with the wing, uh, maybe just a short cable, maybe a long cable, doesn't matter. Um, and they'd be able to get DMX out. So no, um, so there would be no uh, router, no switch, you know, other than the, the tiny one built into the, the uh, node, and they'd be off to the races. So let's walk through how to do that, because I think it's a great example, okay? Um, so across the LS node, if you've never seen the interface for these, this is the four port, so it has A, B, C, D, but if you have the two, it's just A and B. If you have the one, it's just A, right? Um, you, you log right in here, and the first page here is device settings. So we'll set our IP address. Uh, by default, the LS core is gonna be at 2.0.0.1. And so what I would probably do is just leave it there. Um, but the wing by default is also at 2.0.0.1. And that brings up another question, okay? How do you connect to a device that has an IP address like 2.0.0.1? Well, in that case, you need to go on your computer and set an IP address manually. Okay, so if I just connected on my computer here, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, open my network and internet settings. If I just open up my network here and I'm connected via an ethernet cable uh, here in Windows to a ALS node, if that's all that there is, what I would see here is it would generate an IP address, um, usually in the 169.254 range. And it would say something like ethernet private internet, you're not connected to the internet blah, 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 blah. We want to go here to change adapter settings. And then it popped up in my other window here. And then I just go to my, my proper ethernet adapter that I want to go to, go to properties. Actually, I'll do it on this ethernet too, because I'm not using it and I don't want to accidentally send myself offline during a webinar. Then I go to internet protocol version four, TCP IPv4 properties, and then I would use the following IP address manually. So in this case, I would just put 2.0.0.2 or dot, let's just do dot five for the computer. Subnet mask, sure, we'll leave that there, 255.0.0.0. Press okay. You have to close both of these windows. And so now I'm plugged into this Ethernet interface and 
now I can connect to the node out of the box, which is on 2.0.0.1, okay? Once I do that, I pull up this page and I can change this IP address. It works just like the like shark console where you, you hold and tap or double tap in this box. This comes up, you press okay, you change it. I do believe you need to reboot it. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head if it does it automatically or if you just pull power and reboot it real quick. Um, and then you'd be good to go. So we'd set up the node first, which again, uh, from the factory, the IP address is 2.0.0.1, which is the same as the light shark from the factory. Um, so you do need to change the node, I would do that. And then once you've got the IP set, you go to port setup, um, make sure enable is turned on. I like to do SACN. I like to do, and then universe one for port A, same settings, but universe two for port B. Then we're all set up there and we'd be ready to go to the light shark console. So we've got the, we go into our networking settings. And if we just plugged into the data port on the LS1 or the core, uh, we would just turn on the ethernet, set the IP address to 2.0.0.1. Uh, I like to do that static, subnet mask 255.255.255.0. Gateway, you could leave blank in that instance and boom, apply, the light shark will reboot. And then you'd be good to go. You could connect those two with a cable and you'd be rocking and rolling, okay? Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, that's that's really it for this. Uh, so that's the Ethernet control IP. The DMX streaming also is, is different. So you'd want to make sure that one's set up in the same range. And then you'd be ready to plug those in, test them. You'd be ready to rock and roll. Um, if you are not on Windows and you're setting up this network connection, uh, just Google it. Like if you're on a Mac, how to set static IP address on a Mac or on whatever tablet you're on or whatever. There's always a way to do it. Um, and it's not typically that hard to do. Um, and then that's the biggest key as well. When you're connecting to something in the two dot range, you're typically not on the network with internet and you're just going to go ahead and uh, connect those two guys up, make sure the IP addresses are on the same range, and then you'll be good to go from there. Uh, once you do on the nodes, once you do the initial setup here, you know, from the PC and you've got that all set up at that point, you can you know, unplug it. You don't have to connect to this configuration screen ever again, unless your setup changes. Okay. Um, and so, yeah. And so that is the uh, wing, the light shark, as we mentioned, Whoop. on the network setup page, there is the ability here, just as we're working through this uh, to turn off the wireless. So if you're connecting to a larger network, whether that just be a router that you've bought and that you are, um, you know, connecting to basically just a simple, you know, router that uh, you got from the store or from Amazon, then you can turn off this wireless once you've set that up via the ethernet and you're connected successfully. Uh, and the reason why you would want to set up the wire or turn off the wireless rather if you're not using it is it's always broadcasting, right? It's always sending out information on the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi on the channel that's listed here, okay? And so if you're not using that network and you're using a different network, then it's just going to create interference for you. Even if you're on different wireless channels, um, there's still going to be a certain level of interference from the harmonics. Meaning that uh, from, you know, the, the frequency that's at half and a quarter, et cetera. And so you can see those show up and um, ultimately you want to shut that off if you're not using it. Then, as I mentioned here, guys, uh, Ethernet, there's an IP address for the control interface. Um, if you're not using the control via Ethernet, you can technically skip this. So I don't like to. I like to always set it up somewhere that I can get to on the network. And then the DMX streaming is how it sends out that ArtNet or SACN data. You'll want to set that up there, again, in the same range as all your nodes. And then on the DMX setup page, you have your ArtNet or SACN. You can turn that to SACN, ensure it's enabled and apply that, reboot, and you'll be good to go. Uh, this one as well is one you can disable if you're not using it, which I would say, you know, if you're just using the ports on the back and you're not using SACN at all, but you're plugged into a larger network for control, go ahead and shut that off. Um, it's really not doing you anything helpful. And, you know, 
best case scenario, it's not doing anything, you know, on the network. Worst case scenario, it slows everything else down a hair. And, and so you should probably turn that off if you're not using it. Uh, on the topic of the wing, the wing actually has uh, three IP addresses, I believe. And so it has a IP address uh, for this control interface. Then it also has an IP address for um, OSC. It has an IP address uh, for the DMX as well, okay? And those are all configurable here at the top. So like the DMX node, if we turn it on, they're both on now. We can set our node's IP address. It can be separate from the control interface of this wing, which makes it really powerful. Uh, and we're able to set that just like we've been talking about here today for, every, for everything else. You can set up your Artnet or SACN that we're receiving on. And then you've got two node outputs on the back of your wing as well, which again, can be anywhere within that network system. All right. Uh, the wing also shows you the ports here at the bottom. It's kind of cool. And it shows you what's connected to it. And uh, green is uh, full gigabit speed. And then uh, orange is uh, not gigabit, 100 megabit speed. It just tells you that that's what the device on the other end has. So kind of cool there um, as well. So at this point, guys, I would love to take any questions you have on networking through these light shirt consoles, um, through the wing, the nodes, etc. I'm going to go back to the node while I wait and see uh, while people are typing in their questions and I see those guys come in and mention that the uh, on the port set up the nodes do have a merging that you might be aware of. So if you do have multiple light shark consoles in the same venue and you wanted them to be able to merge, meaning, you know, sometimes you're using the LS1, sometimes you're using the core, or maybe you have two operators at the same time and you want to merge the output together. Uh, that can be really helpful in like film and TV stuff, or uh, maybe you have some wall panels and you want to keep those totally separate. Uh, you can use the merging function here on this side of the, the node, which allows you to just turn on a merge. And then you just set up two different DMX universes. So the universe um, that will um, be your... Uh, your primary universe will be right here, okay, universe one. And then your secondary universe uh, can be any other universe, and that would be whatever the backup console is sending. And then they'll merge together either via HTTP, which is uh, generally recommended, or LTP, okay. Um, and then the secondary does uh, come in, or the resend rather, comes in um, handy as well as uh, a universe that it resends that data down if you had other nodes that want that same information on there. Now, often that's not the case, but you know, you, know, you never know when you may want that info. Awesome guys, so that in a nutshell is networking in the light shark. Um, I know that's a lot of information and I hope I uh, covered things pretty well today for you guys. Um, if you do have other questions though, about networking, about the light shark in general. Glad to take those now, answer uh, whatever questions you've got. If you're just like, okay, my head feels like it's about to explode from all that info. I don't know a thing about networking, but now I do, then that's great too. We're happy to have brought you there today. And if not, you know, that's totally cool as well. Awesome. I see a question coming in. Oh, nope. No question there. Okay. Thank you for thanking me. Um, but yeah, happy to, to uh, glad to answer that. Ultimately, the cool thing about the light sharks, as we went through uh, many examples earlier, is that, you know, everything they do is based on working on a network. And so they're very friendly being on networks, whether they be small networks, whether they be big networks. And, uh, you know, there's no matter what your needs are, there's generally a way to set them up that's uh, 
going to do everything that you wanted to do and uh, not be too difficult in the end to work out. Awesome, folks. I'll just wait another minute uh, to see if there's any more questions. And if there's not, no worries. That's no problem at all. Um, you guys know where to find us in the uh, Facebook group and uh, other places if you're familiar. If you're not familiar with the Facebook group, that's just at uh, facebook.com slash light shark users, the light shark users group. I'll pop it up here for kicks. And uh, yeah, here we have our announcement about today's webinar. Boo, we're going to pull that off. All right. And um, you know, there's people are always asking questions in here, getting help and feedback and all that stuff. And if you're not a member, come join us there for sure. Glad to answer any questions you got there. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for hanging out today. Looks like we've uh, answered everything that's come in. Uh, thank you for listening. Hope you learned something new today. As always, guys, we do post uh, the finale. We do post the uh, final recordings of these once they're ready on YouTube and I will post it in that users group as well. So you can catch it there. You can catch uh, the replay if you were confused about anything, whatever, or just let us know uh, in the users group and uh, we're glad to help you out. Awesome, have a great day and I uh, will see you around the web. Thanks.